The Lord has given me a word for today. I wish I could say it was really settled in my heart. It'll be settled as we go along. And so, um, Lord, I just give myself to you totally. Father, I give my mouth to you. I give everything that you want to say to these people, to this body. Father, I thank you for your anointing. I thank you, Lord, for the good pleasure of your heart towards this body of people. And Father, I thank you for how they have embraced me. I thank you, Lord, that when I come here, I feel like I'm coming home. I feel truly like I belong. In fact, Father, I belong here more than I do anywhere else. And I thank you, Lord, that the word that you have for them will be a blessing, will be a direction, and an encouragement. And I thank you for it, Father, in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Let the woman speak. You know, last time I was here, I spoke about prison. And I remember walking down those stairs thinking, do I really have enough courage to do this? Because um, I might say a lot of things about forerunners, but I would have never thought to talk about prison because you're probably the freest place that I go to. I think I might have even mentioned that. And I spoke really from the perspective of people being in individual prisons because we create our own prisons, don't we? Sometimes we're afraid, sometimes we're depressed. Um, and all these things God would want to change if we would just allow him. Um, so I really talked from that point of view. Uh, honestly, I've been working on this. I've been mulling this over in my mind for, uh, I would say, at least a month. Um, I hate to really be exaggerate, but I would say that would be an honest estimate and today is the first day that it occurred to me that I had no idea the depth of that word and what it might mean for you. Um, and I probably didn't even give it correctly. Um, although much of that would be true um, for all of us. But I have titled this The Exodus. Now, uh, of course, you're making an exodus, and, and I know that. But what really does that mean? Like, why, why do we have exoduses? Why was there an exodus, and it, it was given so much place in the Bible? And why is it important to you today? Well, there's a lot of aspects of, of exodus, um, the Bible, uh, the book of the Bible. Um, one, you saw a man that um, had gone into obscurity for 40 years, who didn't really want to come out of obscurity. He was happy where he was, um, come into God's timing and his sense of release. Um, Exodus is also about... Exodus would be about the trials of getting free. You know there were ten plagues? And you know that each time that Moses went to Pharaoh, Pharaoh got harder on God's people. Now what kind of sense does that make? Well, you're right. Because, really and truly, the people didn't want to leave. You know, they were happy there. They maybe didn't like being a slave, but they came home and they got to eat every night, and they liked the food that they ate. And they got very complacent 
in the position where they were. And so God had a plan. And God's plan was to take them to the promised land. So I'm declaring to you all today, you are going to the promised land. You might not look at it now. You might not understand it. It might have come about by circumstances that didn't seem like it was God. You believe one way and another thing happened. How different is that from many other stories that we find in the Bible? And yet God's purpose was served, right? So the important thing to remember is that leaving isn't always easy. And it's important not to get discouraged in the process because there's always opposition. And you can always focus on what's wrong. But God wants you this day to focus on what's right. And look at your promised land. So I gave a, a little bit of thought to what is your promised land. I mean, what kind of a land are you going to? I know that you're all going to go to home groups, but that's not really your land. Because we're talking about not where you reside or where you meet, but we're talking about your spiritual land. And your spiritual land, each one of you, is going to grow. And signs, wonders, and miracles are going to be part of your spiritual land if you'll take it. But you've got to move to be able to have it. Now, I could give this word, actually, to a lot of people in a lot of places and a lot of churches. Um, I, I wouldn't be the only one preaching signs, wonders, and miracles. I mean... You just almost have to have one foot in the grave not to be thinking about that today. But the difference with you all is that your name is Forerunners. You truly are forerunning. And so you're going to this promised land and you're going to lead the rest. You are a leader of the pack. Every one of you. And me, as much as I'm identified with you. And I said to my husband, the other night, I said, you know, I really feel like there are more people like me here than there are at home. <laughs> I, really, I, it's like I can talk on the, uh, it's just so much nicer. Um, so be that as it may, maybe I won't share this CD at home. <laughs> no, I, I have really wonderful relationships at home. A really wonderful but there's some grounding here that is meant for me and um, it's just awesome when I get to come back so anyway back to Exodus so what does it really really look like well there are ten plagues I don't think God is determined to send you through ten plagues but I do think there'll be trials and the, and, and the interesting thing is, is that the plagues were really never meant. They weren't meant for, the, for God's children. They were meant for the Egyptians to let the children go. But they were affected because Pharaoh got harsher and they had to go collect their own straw. You know the story as well as I do. So it did affect them. Even though the flies might not have come into their house. They had the blood on their door. Their firstborn didn't die. They didn't have frogs on the, their front porch. But, <laughs> that's a woman for you. <laughs> that's an apostolic thought. Uh, but they were still affected because the government of the land stood against them and made life harder. And then they go through the ten plagues and, you know, Moses goes to God and complains and he says, you know, what is it that you're doing? I don't, I don't see them, I don't see us going and things are just getting harder and I'm getting a lot of flack. And God says, watch what I am about to do. 
Watch what I am about to do with you. So we all know what God, God did. He took them out. He even allowed them to plunder the land. I mean, they didn't even really have to go steal or anything. They just went and knocked on the door and said, give me this and give me that, and people did. So, as bad as it was, it was also really pretty good. They went out, they weren't broke, and they might not have liked the pair of shoes. I hope they put on a pair of shoes that they liked to leave because they certainly did last a long time. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's one to remember. <laughs> Wear the clothes you like, <laughs> put on the shoes you like. <laughs> Because you don't know how long the journey is going to be. Um, I felt the word to you is, in, the, in, in Exodus, it, God led them by the way of the wilderness. And, and the reason why he did that was because there was going to be war with the Philistines. And he thought they'd, they'd run back to Egypt. And he so desperately wanted them free that he didn't want them to go back to Egypt. So what did he do? He took them around a longer way through the wilderness. And of course, we all know they got stuck there. Um, God is not taking you by way of the wilderness. You're not going, you know why? Because you're trained in warfare. You all know how to warfare. And if there's one of you out there that doesn't, learn in a hurry. And, and they were ordered in ranks. So they were ready for war. They just didn't have the mindset of war. And they would have run back. And what did they do when the Egyptians came? Well, it was instant defeat. I mean, now, look, think about this. And your own life. There's this huge sea in front of you. And there's this man with a staff. And then there's the Egyptian army behind you. And all the chariots and, and all the fear that you had known. And so you think you're going to die. You are not going to die. You are going on to cross over and you are going to a promised land, one that God has prepared for you, where you will bring other people in to the blessing that you are about to receive. Now, the thing is, it's very important how you read the signs. It's really important. Because if you read the signs, like, woe is me and I'm going to die in the Red Sea, or the Egyptians are going to kill me, they might. Because we know that the thing we fear, sometimes we bring upon us. We all know that. So you can be looking at all the things that's wrong all around you. And it's frightening. But if you look at that, that's where you'll live. Your vision has got to be God's vision, particularly in this hour. It's true for all of us, but it's especially true for you today and in the months ahead. And God is going to do incredibly miraculous things with this body. Um, I wanted to go also to the woman with oil. You remember that Elisha um, came across this woman that, that was going to have to sell her sons. And um, so he said, well, what do you have? You know, God said the same thing to Moses. What do you have? Well, Moses had a stick or a staff. You know, how important is that? Well, it was pretty important. So what did this woman have? Nothing but a little bit of oil. Nothing but a little bit of oil. Well, the question
question is, what do you have today? Now, this woman, imagine the circumstances that she found herself in. And she, um, it's recorded in Josephus that she was Obadiah's widow. So she had been, in a sense, in the ministry. If, if not ministering herself as a prophet, she was married to a prophet and lived under that unction. And yet, where was she? Not a penny. Nothing and going to have to sell her sons. Now, I, I don't know, but I, I've never been in, I, I've been pretty poor before, but I've never been in a situation where I thought about selling my children. <laughs> and I bet you haven't either. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, he said, what do you have? Nothing but a little bit of oil. We'll go get the little bit of oil and go collect up all the jars. Now, she didn't have to pay for the jars. People were just happy. They were throwaway things. People were just happy to give her the jars. So uh, there was no limit to how many she could collect. None. So when you go, when God tells you to go collect a few jars, don't collect a few, collect a lot. We ought to learn from her. God's a God of a lot. But she collected, or her sons collected enough for her to pull, pour the oil, pay off her debts, and live on the rest, she and her sons. Now, even if she could have collected more jars, that was still a lot. God's provision was there. God's provision is going to be there for you. The question is, what do you have? What do you have? You might not think it's much. I mean, maybe it's just a tiny, tiny word inside of you. But you're afraid to release it. I don't know why you'd be afraid in this body, but I mean, maybe you are. But what do you have? Because God will multiply it. He did it in the Old Testament, he's done it in the New Testament, and he will do it today. The law of multiplication is still around, and God will do it today. This is a day of signs, wonders, and miracles. There's a minister that comes to Louisville once a month. Louisville is um, Louisville, for those of you that aren't Kentuckians. And um, that's where I live. And it's a little, little tiny church. And basically, he uh, ministers, uh, mostly just ministers come. And he says, he's been incredibly successful. He has been up and down and everywhere, probably much like you all have, where you've had plenty, you've had little. And he's been through all of that. And this is his year of plenty. But in times past, when it hasn't been his year of plenty and he didn't have enough and the offering wasn't very good, he'd make him count it until it was what he needed. And you know God came through. He said, so he's talking to a lot of pastors, um, of which I'm not one, praise the Lord. And um, he said, if you don't have enough, tell him to count it again. Tell him to count it again. Count it again. But see what you've got in your house. Because what you might have no esteem for. Who would think that you would get your life's provision out of a little bit of oil? Who would think that? Well, I wouldn't think that. In fact, some of us throw away a little bit of oil, don't we? Oh, maybe it's gone a little bit off or whatever. We throw it away. And what are we throwing away that God would use to prosper us, perhaps, for the rest of our lives? Now, I'm talking to you, but I could just as easily be sitting there. I'm talking to myself, too. Um, I said once before, well, I probably said it a lot more than once, <laughs> but if I only give you what I've accomplished, 
I, I won't give you very much. <laughs> I mean, the truth is, I have to go beyond myself. So I don't want you to hold me to the standard of every word I speak. Because I am speaking sometimes beyond my reality. But I am not speaking beyond God's reality. And you really didn't come to hear my reality. You came to hear God's. And so I'm trying to tap in to God's reality and bringing it down here. And that's why I get away with saying some of the things I get away with. Because his reality is really pretty big. And the thing is, is he wants to make our reality that big. He wants to make it just like his. This is a time where God wants to come and dwell among his people. And I'm so excited about that. Okay, so where am I? Well, I passed prison. <laughs> Aren't we glad about that? Some of us, myself included, would think we're slow of speech, like Moses. I talk myself out of talking all the time. And if you ask my husband, I talk too much. So what, what's that all about? But it's different. <laughs> It's, it's different when I'm addressing God's people on godly matters. And so I think I'm slow of speech. And maybe I am. <laughs> but I've decided I'm not going to have an errand. I'm going to be the woman of God that he has called me to be. And if I stumble a little bit, well, at least I'm here. Right? <laughs> I could be someplace that wasn't as accepting, right? I could be. And probably will be. So Moses was slow of speech. God said, Who made your mouth? Well, who made your mouth? Who gave you the word to set the captives free? You all have that word. Your mission is to set the captives free. Oh, is it free from disease? Is it free from financial ruin? Is it free from living in darkness and not knowing Jesus? What kind of freedom do the people in your workplace, what kind of freedom do they need? Whatever it is, you've got the answer. Because God wants to put it inside of you to give to them. You know, we all know Jesus lives inside of us. Well, why do we think he lives there? He lives there so that we can be Jesus to all the people we meet. But are we? Well, sometimes. Sometimes we are. And many times we're not. And we have to be courageous. Now, we could talk about all the things that are wrong in the world. You know what? There's a lot wrong. There's a lot wrong here. There's a lot wrong in Greece. There's a lot wrong in America. There's a lot wrong everywhere. What does that tell you? It only tells you the world needs you. They have a great need of what you've got. Because you've got Jesus inside of you. So we've got to release that gift of God that's in us. It's more critical today than it has ever been. And you all have been incredibly blessed. You've been given a rich word. You have been given experiences in God. And God will hold each and every one of you. Not just the leaders. This really isn't a message for the leaders. They already know. They're going to lead you through this. This is a message for you because each and every one of you has deliverance in your hand. You've got a staff. You've got signs, wonders, and miracles. And I am so excited about the time that God has chosen for us to live. Oh yeah, I know. I mean, you know, I, no, I'm not going to say that. Um, <laughs> but I know. <laughs> I, I know things. 
and so do you. And it doesn't always look godly. But you know what the Lord said? When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, look up. Your redemption draweth nigh. So maybe that tells us that we have a work to do. Because they're just people who are frustrated. And they're depressed. And they're in the prison. Well, I think it was interesting, and I think it was the last time I was here. Maybe it was a time before. But I did talk about being in prison. And I, I never really thought of it as a corporate body. But you see, you all were being held to a form that was pleasant. I mean, look at it. You come here on Saturday afternoon and you have lunch, and then you enjoy one another and you eat together and you fellowship, and you hear, you know, e either you do a Bible study or you hear somebody talk to you, and um, you do something, and then you haven't had enough fellowship, so you have some more. So it's, it's comfortable, and you like it, and I don't blame you. I like it too. But God is saying, there's something else for you. This is bigger than your fellowship or your comforts. This is bigger. And so you're going on to the promised land. And you're going to love it. And the other thing about the promised land is, you know, it, it's like, well, you think, am I always going to have to do this? Am I always going to have to change houses? Am I always going to have to change, you know, church buildings? Am I always going to have to change this and change that? No. For a season, we do live like that. But there is a promised land. God brought his people into the promised land. Eventually, they sort of resisted in the beginning. But, you know, you guys are Joshua's and Caleb's. All of you. You're Joshua's and Caleb's. You're raised up to be Joshua and Caleb's. So, um, there are none of the others among you. And if there are, you better hide. Because the troop's moving on. But God still has his promised land mapped out. It hasn't changed. Now, funny enough, they want to give it away. But you know, God will have the last word on that. They divided it up between the tribes, and Judah got this one, and Dan got that one, and so on and so forth. It, so it doesn't mean it's always that you're going to be on the move, but you are right now. Now, I hate to be the bearer of bad tidings, it probably does mean that there are giants in the land, which, in my estimation, you're prepared for. And it does mean there'll be, there'll be battles, there'll be wars, and they'll come up from time to time. Because people won't like you. Imagine that. <laughs> Imagine that. People don't like God's people. But that's the way it is. And you'll have to fight those battles. But if you know that, you're trained in battle. You're trained. You'll make it. I'm excited about your season. Oh, yeah. I mean, th these are my favorite things. I take pictures of them probably every time I come. Um, I love... I, I love this whole atmosphere. I, I like looking around all the wall, even, you know, kid space. <laughs> what I like best is it's kid space, and then on the door it says parents' room. <laughs> There's an irony there. <laughs> I, I'm making this funny, but it's really serious. But sometimes... Sometimes we can 
take the serious a little bit easier if we can laugh with it. But God has a destiny for you, each and every one of you. And there's going to be a bigger troop of you than what exists now. You're like a remnant. And if you notice in the Bible, there are a lot of Gideon episodes in the Bible. God deals with remnants. And you guys are like that. But you're going to build a troop. Now, I had a, a story um, to tell you. I actually called my husband this morning to get it because I wasn't sure I'd get the facts straight. But, oh, some time ago, there's a... Um, a <laughs> it would be funny that we would watch this. Well, not him so much as... It would be funny that I would watch this. Um, but his name is um, Erwin Baxter. And he does a lot of preaching on end times. And he's very knowledgeable. Um, I... I like listening to him. <laughs> he was one of my husband's customers in telecommunications. They did all their telephone service at one time through my husband. And so <laughs> we went up to his church. Now, I knew his church was a little bit different, but <laughs> I didn't realize how different. We, <laughs> we went up to his church. I knew they were Pentecostal. I just didn't have a full revelation of totally what Pentecostal was. And um, anyway, I, of course, wore my jewelry. Um, we went up with another couple that was in ministry that was living with us at the time. And um, they were Aussies, actually. And, um, well, we went up there. They're, um, you know, don't even wear watches. I mean, they don't do a lot of things. Um, <laughs> and women don't really have a, a strong role <laughs> in their ministry. And um, they wouldn't be wearing pants, which of course I did. And there were a few other rules that I broke. But you know, the interesting thing is he was very, very nice and polite to me. But that's just a side rabbit trail. Um, the real thing is the word that he had, he was, um, I don't even know the greater, uh, the great, how this fit into his story. But in World War II, there was Hitler, and um, there was France. And Hitler had decided that he was going to take over France. And I mentioned this Erwin Baxter because it was on his program. Um, he was giving the story. But it would be factual. Um, they were going to take over France. And they just were going through the land, and the troops were retreating to the very corner in the edge of France, and there wasn't any place else to go. And Hitler decided, the interesting thing is, he heard a voice. He heard a voice. And the voice said, this is too easy. So he called all of his generals back to Germany because he thought it was a trap. So they all come back. The generals were furious. Because, you know, they're on the front lines. They knew they had this one. So the generals come back to Germany because the great Hitler spoke. And the Allied forces moved in and started shipping them, I suppose, to England. But anyway, they got them out of France. There were 300,000 men. And all but 40,000 were saved. Because... Hitler heard a voice. Churchill, prime minister at the time, gets on public radio, which is what they had then, gets on, gets on public radio, and what does he say? This truly was a miracle. Now, I'm telling you, that's what we have to look forward to. Don't look at the circumstances. Look at the provision of God and what you have in your house. Because God is going to turn this world upside down and he's going to use every one of you to do it. God bless you. I love you all. I just, I love being here. You guys are all wonderful.